Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to this week with weekly market review. As usual, I have my host with me here, Mr. Gerald Wong. Gerald, how is your weekend? Uh, it was a good weekend. Um, I guess I uh, had to prepare these slides and actually looking at what actually happened in the market over the past week. So even though we are past the result season already, it seems like there are still quite a number of major developments both on the macro front as well as relating to some companies list listed in Singapore. Yes, it seems that uh, even though we are we have finished the earnings seasons already, but then I think market is uh, zooming back their attention front and center into the rate high interest rate situation again. And last week we have uh, hotter than expected the uh, inflation data and PPI data. So that caused a bit of a pullback on, on the global markets, I believe. Will you be able to break that down for us this week? Yes, um, so as usual, whatever that we are sharing today is for information purposes only and should not be taken to be financial advice. Okay, uh, we have an upcoming Ask Sias that is on the 17th of April. Uh, this is a special edition where we welcome um, participants to be asking us questions in this free webinar. So do uh, register early by scanning the QR code that is on this slide. Um, if you find our weekly market review do leave us helpful, do leave us a review on Google. Uh, once again, by going to this site. And if you'd like to consider joining CIAS as a member, uh, it costs $12 per year or just $1 per month. And you can actually benefit from different programs that CIAS puts out. Okay, so what did we see in the market over the past week? Um, we saw a slight fall in the S&P 500 index uh, and the losses were actually led by the tech stocks uh, where we see that the NASDAQ was down by 0.7%. Okay, uh, the SDI did a bit better. So this is a trend that we have seen for the second week where the US market fell, but the STI actually performed well. Uh, so it seems like uh, some of this uh, enthusiasm about the US market is starting to cool off and investors are thinking about how some of the value stocks in the Singapore market uh, might be looking attractive once again. Okay, so the big news that came out last week was really the inflation number for the month for February. Uh, we see that the US consumer price index actually rose by 3.2% uh, compared to the previous year. Okay, so this is slightly higher than what investors were expecting. And if you look at the 3.2% number compared to what we saw in January, uh, there's a bit of a pickup. Okay, so generally, I think that is leading to expectations that inflation might be a bit more sticky compared to what investors were previously expecting. And with that, the Fed might not be able to cut interest rates as quickly as they might want to. Okay, so uh, that is being reflected in the uh, expectations of what the Fed is going to do for the upcoming year. Uh, we have a Fed meeting that's coming up on the 20th of March. And I think for that, investors are now largely expecting that the interest rates will be kept unchanged. Uh, but what is interesting to me is that if I look at the expectations of the rate cuts through the end of 2024, then effectively investors are not expecting that it will be cut as quickly as what the expectations were in the past. Okay, So still looking at potentially the first rate cut coming through in June, I guess because this expectation is still intact, which is why you see that uh, the market has not really corrected that much. But with that, uh, the number of rate cuts expected this year is actually significantly lower because after that, you're just looking at maybe another one in September, another one in December. So that might mean that we are looking at just three rate cuts for this year compared to the initial expectation where there might be seven rate cuts. Okay, so with that, we see a bounce in the US government bond use as well. Okay, so something to take note of uh, for those of you who are interested in bank stocks, REITs, uh, Singapore savings bonds, T-bills, uh, this has an impact on many different instruments and we see that the 10-year US government bond yield has bounced from about 4% now to about the 4.3% levels. 
Okay, so um, quite interesting when we look at the STI performance for the past week, uh, we see a number of standout performers. Uh, Singtel uh, with gains of 4.2%. Uh, we'll go into a bit more detail later. Uh, city developments up by 2.8% after the company uh, accelerated on their share buybacks. And we see the Singapore banks, DBS, UOB, uh, outperforming the STI because of the expectation that maybe their net interest margin might be supported if the interest rates actually stay high. Okay, on the flip side, we see that some of the REITs actually corrected. Uh, so Capital Land Ascender Suite, Maple Tree Logistics Trust, uh, Maple Tree Pan Asia Commercial Trust, all underperforming the STI last week. Uh, and we have got Imperador, the Philippine liquor company, uh, down by 20% on Friday uh, because of the exit from the Straits Times Index. So effective from today, uh, it will be replaced by Fraser Centerpoint Trust, uh, which is a name that we have gone through in the previous weekly market review. Okay, so I'm going to talk about two stocks today. Uh, the first is Singtel. Uh, we saw earlier that the share price did well last week. Uh, and a lot of investors are asking, oh, what is actually driving the strong performance of Singtel? So earlier in the week, uh, one of the Australian newspapers, the Australian Financial Review, uh, actually reported that Singtel is in advanced discussions to be fully divesting its Australian arm, Optus, for about 16 billion Australian dollars. Okay, so if that happens, it is going to be fairly sizable uh, because of the fact that it is a uh, asset that contributes significantly to Singtel's profit. And then at the same time, uh, you are looking at potentially this 16 billion in terms of the value of Optus. Uh, thereafter, Singtel clarified that there's no impending deal to offload Optus for the seed sum. Um, so that is something that the company has come out to announce. Okay, so uh, for those of you who might not be familiar with Singtel or actually observe the share price performance of Singtel over the past 12 months, um, effectively what we see is that the share price has come off um, over the course of the last few years. Um, and effectively, if you look at um, November last year, uh, what happened was that um, the Australian business, which is Optus, uh, faced an outage for an uh, extended period of time. And that actually led to concerns around uh, whether that will affect the profitability, uh, whether that will actually affect the uh, potential for the company to face legal lawsuits in the Australian market. Okay, So it rebounded um, slightly thereafter. Uh, it has been in the $2.30 to $2.50 range. And last week after the um, press report that it is considering selling Optus, uh, we see that it actually rebounded to about $2.50, uh, even though the company subsequently came out to deny uh, some of these press reports. Okay, so um, if I were to look at how much Optus actually contributes to uh, Singtel's profit, uh, then what we see here is that it is fairly sizable. Okay, so if you look at uh, Singapore, which is the bulk of uh, Singtel's uh, core profit, then what we see for Optus is that it is actually still fairly sizable. Uh, in the nine months of fiscal year 2024, it contributed about 190 million of profit versus the Singapore operations, which was 659 million. Okay. Uh, what is also worth noting is that the profit for Optus has come down. Um, part of it is due to various uh, cost increases, uh, but then at the same time, we also see that the currency uh, will have impacted uh, how it is contributing towards the Sing dollar profit. Okay, uh, what the company has also provided as an update is that uh, following the outage in November last year, uh, they have taken some steps to remedy the situation and starting to see some improvement in metrics. Uh, so whether it's in terms of the brand perception, uh, number of customers uh, who are using their postpaid network, as well as the number of customers who have a positive uh, view of the company, uh, they have recovered over the past few months. Okay, so I think all of this actually stems from 
uh, what Singtel is actually now pursuing, which is a capital recycling strategy uh, where it actually aims to be able to improve shareholder returns uh, by recycling some of this capital. And what this means is that they might sell some of the underperforming assets and invest the capital into other assets that might provide better returns or better growth. Okay. So, so far in uh, FY22 and FY23, uh, they recycled about $5 billion worth of capital. And the um, expectation is that they want to be able uh, to increase this to about $6 billion. And some of this could come through from the regional data centers, uh, the comm center, uh, which will provide this $2 billion of proceeds. But then they're also looking at value to be uh, unlocked from other assets. Okay, so outside of this uh, capital recycling initiative, uh, Singtel is also looking to be able to write on a few different trends. Uh, so the first one is the improvement in roaming uh, as people start to travel more often uh, with the post-COVID recovery. Uh, they've identified two key growth businesses, which is NCS and Regional Data Center, uh, which are expected to ride the digitalization wave and also looking at some of these regional associates, uh, such as those in India, Thailand, and Indonesia. Okay, so with that, uh, what the company has done is to grow the dividends once again. Uh, we saw that they raised the interim dividend by 13% to 5.2 cents per share. And I think the um, increase in Singtel share price after the press report about a potential divestment of Optus uh, would tie in with this and the investors are hoping that if that actually happens, uh, they might be able to get a higher dividend as a result. Okay, so in a nutshell, those are the key developments for Singtel. Uh, we are await to see whether uh, the sale actually eventually takes place. But even in the meantime, uh, there are a lot of other things that they are doing to actually improve the returns to shareholders. Okay, uh, next we have Citrum, uh, which had an investor day last week. And with that, they announced a number of different targets that they hope to be able to achieve in five years' time. Uh, so first and foremost, to be able to grow the earnings before interest, taxation, uh, depreciation, and amortization. Okay, so that's quite a big mouthful, uh, which is the EBITDA number to more than 1 billion by 2028. Okay, so with that, they are targeting that the return on equity will grow to above 8%, and they hope to be able to keep the gearing level of the company relatively low, uh, with the net debt to EBITDA at about two to three times. Okay, so first and foremost, we look at the profit target. Okay, um, what they are looking to do uh, to, is to actually grow the revenue. So if I were to look at the long-term trend of Citrum's revenue, uh, what we see is that from 2011 to 2013, they were able to do about, 20, uh, about 9 to 12 billion. Uh, that fell to about 3 to 6 billion from 2018 to 2020 uh, because of the fall in oil prices. Uh, picked up slightly in 2023 uh, as the improvement for this oil equipment and some of the renewable projects actually led to a stronger order book for Citrum. And they are hoping that this will grow to 10 to 12 billion by 2028. Okay, so uh, where is this growth expected to be coming from? Uh, first and foremost, they are looking to target more green products. Uh, so you see this green column over here. Uh, that was not something that the company did a lot of prior to 2020. Uh, but they are hoping that with this energy transition, uh, it will actually lead to more orders within the renewable segment. Okay. Uh, outside of that, they are also looking to increase the share of repairs and upgrades. Uh, so that is actually what we see in this bar, such that they are able to then grow the overall revenue to 10 to 12 billion. Okay, so with the improvement in revenue, what they hope to be able to do is to improve the profitability as well. So I mentioned earlier 1 billion of EBITDA, uh, growing from 0 0.2 billion in 2023. Okay, 
So that will help the company to turn around from being negative returns to more than 8% returns by 2028. Okay, uh, if you recall, we saw last year that uh, Semcorp Marine actually combined with Capital Offshore Marine and that actually formed the Citrum that we know today. And they have also provided an update that they have actually been able to realize cost savings uh, through this business combination. So 300 million of annualized synergies and cost savings uh, coming through from a reduction in corporate overheads as well as asset rationalization. And at the same time, if I were to look at the procurement, they've had some savings there as well from a centralized procurement after the business combination. So this cost savings is also expected to help improve the returns as the revenue picks up. And that is what is driving the company's belief that they will turn from negative returns towards a 8% ROE. Okay, so uh, with that, uh, we have quite a number of uh, companies that are going ex-dividend this week. We have got Sasurid, uh, the Jardin related names. Uh, and then at the same time, we also have the Fed meeting that is coming up on the 20th of March. So quite a number of different things that we are keeping a lookout for. Uh, and we'll continue to keep you updated on some of these developments. So with that, I'll hand over to Sunny, who will give us an update on how the technical indicators are looking like. Okay, thanks, Gerald, for that in-depth sharing. I will do a recap of how the charts or the technicals are looking at. Uh, looking like on the uh, major indices. So as you can see, uh, STI did have a some kind of a rebound since last Monday when we were on the market, uh, really market review. The, so this trend of uh, when interest rate uh, is going to remain higher, when inflation gets sticky, you see a pullback from the, uh, the major US indices, then STI will have a rebound. So this is uh, because the STI index... Uh, I think close to half of it, the last I checked, is about 40 to 50% of the STI index uh, comprises the weightage comprises of the three banks. So whenever interest rates is likely going to stay high, the net interest income of the, the three local banks are likely going to benefit from it. And hence, it will push the STI index up. So that is the relationship between the US market, the interest rate projections, and the STI index. So... Of course, the flip side of it would then be your property counters and your REITs would then have a, a pullback as well because uh, those, are, those are companies that have leverage and we, all, we closely watch their leverage ratio. So once uh, if interest rates stay high, the, the beneficiary will of course be the bank and then those that will have those companies that have some concerns on their stock price would be those the, the REITs and the property sector companies. Okay, so on the STI index, uh, we have always been saying that the, the, the support level is around this zone. My level, I'm look, the level I'm looking at is 3,100. The previous time uh, in early part of March, we missed that by one point and then the market sort of it went up again. So this is because of the, um, like what I said earlier, the, the situation that's developing where we projected uh, seven to eight rate cuts uh, this, this year. But in two and a half months, we are not even at the end of March now. Uh, those Half of those uh, expectations of interest rate cuts have already evaporated. So we are looking at only three to four towards the end of the year. Some of the local banks' economies actually said we will probably most likely only see three rate cuts this year. So that is why uh, the, with the interest rate staying high, the STI and the banks in Singapore actually push the STI up. So when, when STI arises last week, right, we actually back to testing the red color line that you see here, which is the long-term moving average. That's the 200 days moving average. So we hit this level somewhere on, on Thursday uh, last week. And then you can see it straight away on Friday itself, we have sort of a red candle coming down. So today, uh, on Monday, we are still testing this 200 days moving average. I think this, this resistance level now will likely hold. And I believe so. This is uh, going to be a, a pivot level, as you can see. It's also very close to the, uh, the Bollinger Band basis right in the middle of the upper and the lower bound of the Bollinger Band. So as of now, I think uh, since it's at the midpoint mark of, of the Bollinger Band, there's not much we can do on the STI index, uh, whether we go long or we go short. The trade setup does not seem to be in our favor. The risk and reward ratio is not there yet. So my, my preferred option would definitely be still to wait for a pullback towards the 3,100 points level before um, I, I will look back again on the STI index. So uh, the... 
the indicators are showing signs that the STI uh, is likely going to push up. According to the MACD indicator, you can see that we have a crossover of the MAC line above the signal line somewhere on the uh, last Thursday as well, 14th of March. So that means that there is some kind of a positive momentum right now with a positive reading on the MACD indicator. Uh, the, the STI index might push higher, but like I said, even though it pushed higher, the risk and reward ratio is not in my favor. The next resistance level that I'm watching will be the upper bound of the Bollinger Band, the black line here, 3230, that is the first resistance. Else, the uh, the year-to-date high somewhere around the 21st February at 3250 would definitely be a very strong resistance as well. So these two may find some kind of confluence uh, going forward and hence uh, be a very strong uh, resistance level for the STI index. The RSI is uh, now reading at 54, so it's uh, four points above the 50-point neutral mark. So that means also uh, agreeing with what the MACD is saying, there's some positive momentum in the uh, in the STI index right now. If you're a day trader, you can play the next one or two daily candles for the STI to go up. But then I think um, on the longer term, the risk and reward ratio for a swing trade towards the top side of 3002 and the bottom side of 3001, we are very close to somewhere in the, in the middle right now. So... I will have a wait and see approach on the STI index and hopefully uh, if this resistance uh, is supposed to stay, then that, uh, we have a chance of we pull back to 3,100 points level and then that could be the level that we are look at, we can look at to get back on the STI index. Now, if I do a some kind of a trend projection, uh, you can see that the low on 30th October and 7th October provide this green line, which is on an uptrend. If I'm going to do another one combining the, the December as well as the low in February this year, you can see that straight away we hit this point and then uh, we have a rebound here. So this probably would be the trajectory that we are looking at now for the STI index. So if you follow this uh, trajectory point, this trend of connecting the low of December as well as the low in February, and then we have another confirmation that this uptrend line may be able to hold with the test on last Tuesday, then probably a pullback to at least a 3,110 points level that could uh, that could uh, ring some uh, alarm bells or ring some alerts that we should start to look at the STI index again. So now is uh now the the support for STI index will be either around 3,100 to the 3,110 level. Okay, so next let's move to the US indices. So you can see we have, for the Dow Jones index, we have a pullback of 0.49% last Friday, down 190 points, one of the uh, one of the major pullback days that we have this year. We have identified uh, the key resistance level on 12th of February, where we put this uh, blue arrow over here. Uh, just want to highlight uh, on top of the economic uh, calendar that we saw on Gerald just now, there is one additional one you might want to take note of. That is the uh, Fed FOMC economic projections. We will get more clues, although the market feels that we, we may have three or four rate cuts uh, towards the end of the year, according to the CME Fed Watch 2. But we also want to have an understanding of how the Fed is looking at it. Are they agreeing that we should be seeing three or four rate cuts or would there be more or less? So the FOMC meeting um, this week on 21st March, I think it's a Thursday, that would give us uh, some kind of a, a clue to the outlook of what the Fed is looking at. Of course, interest rate decision, we are looking at uh, staying put at 5.5%. Okay, so that is the key thing that to look out for this week that will move the market, I believe. So um, we the Dow Jones Index has more or less a peak right now. It has been trending in a sideway movement since the, uh, the, the middle part, the mid part of February. So I'm going to put a line over here. The reason is because I believe that this might be a short term kind of a ranging a range bound formation that the Dow Jones index might be forming. And if this range bound formation is going to be true, then you can see that the blue color line, which is the 50 days of moving average, would likely be the key support level to look out for for the Dow Jones index. Uh, at the moment, the key indices that you can see over here, MACD indicator has been on a downtrend since the beginning of the year. Uh, the the down, downside momentum has actually accelerated slightly last Friday. So this week, towards the uh, economic uh, projections of the FOMC meeting, that will be the key thing to watch whether uh, this, this downside momentum is likely going to accelerate further. On the RSI, as you can see as well, it pulled back from last week reading of around 59 or 60 to the 50-point neutral mark that we see now. So the Dow Jones Index, according to the economic 
electronic indicators reading is either going to be neutral, neutral means going sideways and range bound, or slightly negative, that means testing the lower bound of, of, of the range at least. So that would, the lower bound of the Bollinger Band, the 50 days moving average, as well as the low that we see on 13 February, those are the key levels to watch. Uh, if let's say the rally is going to continue, we need to have a bounce around this area. If we break this level, we may go into a midterm uh, downtrend or a midterm pullback that we are looking at towards the 100 days moving average at 37,312 points. Okay, let's, let's move to the S&P 500. Okay, so of course, S&P 500 being the broader index has a, a greater, uh, higher performance, or I would say a high, the, the rate of momentum going up this year is actually pretty high. We, did, we have not observed the, the topish kind of a formation that you see on the Dow Jones index on the S&P 500 or the... Uh, or all the NAS all the NASDAQ composite index yet. But what I'm looking at here is uh, we determined that uh, from 12 of February, probably this might be a resistance level. We have a pullback to the 20 days moving average. And then, uh, of course, the S&P 500 continue to set new all-time high. So the, the, the most recent high that we have or the year-to-date high that we have is now at 5,189 points. So now we are at 5,117 points. So is this 20 days moving average still intact? Okay, that is the question that uh, I think a lot of chartists will be asking themselves because we have been seeing in February, in January, all this well, once it hits the 20 days moving average, prices would have a rebound. So this will be tested, I believe, this week. And according to the indicators, you can see that uh, MACD indicator is telling us that uh, there is some a more uh, downside momentum right now or negative momentum right now because uh, the MAC line is diverging away from the signal line and the momentum seems like it's likely going to go downwards. The RSI is also saying the same thing. The reading now is at 57, came back down from the high of last week of 66 point. So even though it is uh, coming down, but it's still, a, a, it's still in a positive or above the 50 point neutral mark reading, I would say. So that means that there might still be some kind of a momentum in the, in the S&P 500 index. So will the, will, the, will the 20 days moving average hold on to this uh to uh hold on to the bounce this time round. I think uh I, I I cannot be sure to say that it will bounce this time round. A lot of it determine uh will be determined on the the Fed projection uh, out this Thursday. If this 20 days moving average does not hold then the next support that you're looking at, which I am more confident in is will be the 4,972 points, which is the 50 days moving average, the blue line that you see here, which is now coinciding with the low bound of the Bollinger Band. That would give me more confidence. And that could also, if that pullback happened, it could also provide a more healthy long-term rebound for the S&P 500 index. Why is that so? Because the previous time that we tested the lower bound of the Bollinger Band, you can see that we have a very strong uptrend going upwards. So if this, this scenario happened again, I'm definitely more confident than the short-term 20 days moving average. Once it hits the low bound of the Bollinger Band, we could see the next run of the S&P 500 starting to happen again. So if it hits this 4,972 points or just below the 5,000 handle, I am going to be uh, loading up on S&P 500 index again. Next uh, to the tech-heavy NASDAQ Composite Index. So NASDAQ Composite Index, uh, the high, the Year-to-date high that we see or the all-time high that we see is around the 16,449 points, okay? So that is the high that we have seen it on the 8th of March and then we have a pullback. We have a bit of a pullback now. So where is the NASDAQ Composite uh, Index heading? Of course, we are also testing the uh, 20 days moving average. But if you take the NASDAQ Composite Index as a Q, right, it has already sort of, I think, closed below or a convincing close below the 20 days moving average. So likely the next support will be the 50 days moving average at 15,633 points. So that's what I'm looking at. And if you look at the indicators of the MACD and RSI of the NASDAQ Composite Index, it's definitely more pessimistic compared to the S&P 500. So if the NASDAQ Composite Index is taking the lead, the tech stock is taking the lead in the pullback about the high interest rate uh, situation, then um, definitely the pullback will, will move into the 50 days moving average at 15,633 points. So that is the key support level that I'm looking at. I'm looking at, um, I'm taking some cues from the NASDAQ Composite Index to see uh, if it pullbacks, then the S&P 500 will likely follow. Okay, so that is uh, the updates that I have for, for the major indices this week. Uh, Gerald, anything to add? Well, I think the conclusion is just look out for what the Fed meeting actually shares with us 
on the interest rate direction, uh, what Fed Chairman Jerome Powell would say during the press conference to get an idea around where the market might be heading towards next. Yes, I think that will give us a lot of clues uh, for traders and investors as well, how to reposition their portfolio, how to reposition their, position their trades uh, going forward to the second queue of this year. Okay, I think that's all the time that we have for this week, a weekly market review. We thank you for your time for joining us this afternoon. And uh, in the meantime, do uh, trade safe and stay safe. And we'll see you next week in the next weekly market review. Goodbye.